Good evening. So this is our um, eighth session of 12. Uh, tonight's topic is cross-country soaring and land out field selection. Now, before we get started in the meat and potatoes of the slideshow, uh, we're going to talk about um, some of the preparations that you need. You as the budding uh, cross-country pilot, it is an introductory presentation on getting started in cross-country soaring and landing out. So topics will include um, preparations, we're going to talk about use the budding pilot, paperwork, and so forth, um, reiterating uh, types of lift, a brief introduction to polar curves, um, tips on help you on your first cross-country task, and things to be aware of when landing out. So, with respect to preparations, um, as part of the preparation needed, we need to discuss you as the budding cross-country pilot and the necessary and recommended paperwork. Of course, you need the proper attitude to go cross-country soaring. You need uh, to have a positive attitude. You need to have the confidence and the willingness to cut the apron strings and get beyond your home field. Um, of course, before we start any flying session, you are always, you're always going through the, the acronym, the I'm safe, and that is I for illness, that you're not feeling ill. Your medication, if you're taking any medication, it's not going to affect your decision-making skills. Uh, you're under just normal stress. You shouldn't be under undue stress. Uh, that might affect your decision-making. You haven't uh, consumed alcohol in the last eight hours. Um, F, fatigue, you are not overly fatigued, you're not feeling fatigued, you're bright, you're active, you're alert, and E, you have eaten, so uh, you need to start the day with food in your stomach and consume food as the day progresses, and of course you need to bring some food with you on your cross-country flight, including something to drink. And then we're going to look at paperwork, so we're going to look at the, uh, the itinerary, what, you're, uh, what you plan on doing, things that need to be covered, and if this is a declaration flight, an FAI declaration flight for a badge, um, you need to do the necessary paperwork for that as well. And here we have uh, a picture of Dave Donaldson. And he has just completed his 50 kilometer silver badge flight as he landed uh, at York soaring. It was a one-way flight from Great Lakes Gliding Club and he did that in a 126, a Schweitzer 126. A great day for Dave. Now you might be wondering or asking yourself what type of glider would be suitable for cross-country soaring? Well as you can see from the previous slide, uh, 126s have been used uh, for cross-country soaring. Um, However, they are somewhat limited in their performance and I think you need to be cognizant of that fact and pick your days. Uh, it needs to be a good soaring day if you choose to use that type of glider. However, any intermediate type of uh, glider with a glide ratio of 30 to 1 or, or, 30 to 1 or better um, would certainly be sufficient for cross-country soaring. And I've listed some of the gliders that are typically found uh, in our vicinity at some of the SAC uh, affiliated clubs. So anywhere from K6s uh, right up to uh, standard Jantars and so forth. Um, many different types of gliders are suitable certainly for cross-country soaring. Um, and, and this list includes you know, both club and privately owned. And if you are renting these type of gliders from your uh, club, they should be relatively reasonable to rent. And if you are looking to purchase any one of these, they don't require massive funds to purchase. So anyone's listed there, and that's just, that's just a small list. There's other gliders certainly that would fill the bill, but these ones would certainly be suitable um, for cross-country soaring. So with respect to skills, your club will um, want you to have acquired the following badges uh, before they're going to allow you to take one of their ships out on a cross-country flight. So you need to have completed your A, B, and C badges. And of course, the A badge is your first solo flight. The B badge is a 30-minute flight from an aero tow release. The C badge is two hours total solo time. 
in addition to a one-hour soaring flight. And then, of course, the bronze badge, which was actually developed, um, designed to prepare you for your first cross-country flight. It includes the fact that you need your glider pilot license, two soaring flights of two hours, three spot landings, and that when we define a spot landing, that's where you have to clear a one meter obstacle and land within 150 meters of a designated stopping point. And you need to do three consecutive spot landings for you to uh, have completed that part of the badge. You also need to demonstrate the ability to assemble and disassemble the glider um, in case, of course, you happen to land out. And, of course, you need to have some theoretical soaring knowledge. The two soaring flights of two hours, that's just, again, to demonstrate that you can find thermals and sustain yourself in lift for a duration period of time. Now, building on your skills, taking small steps is always a good way to go. And uh, what we suggest is that you start to create some small tasks, small, in, small tasks that help you build your skill, build your confidence, uh, starting to venture a little bit further away from the field, but still within gliding range. And some examples include things like dolphin flying, and that's simply where you are, will slow down and lift and speed up and sink, and uh, basically your flight resembles like a small roller coaster ride. Um, flying upwind after thermaline, so you're going to cap out a, a thermal, you're going to take it to the top, and then you're going to just head out upwind, and maybe just fly straight, see how far you can go without circling. Um, certainly keeping in mind that, that when you get to that point where, okay, I think I need to turn back because you want to make sure that you've got enough altitude to make your, your home field. So just, again, just trying a few different things that maybe you haven't been trying in some of your local flights. Um, another example might be to fly with a shepherd. And Basically what that means is it's like team flying. So you've uh, found someone in your club that's got cross-country experience and they've agreed to, to go up with you. So they're in their ship, you're in yours, and you're going to basically follow them. They're the shepherd, you're the sheep, and they're going to lead you from thermal to thermal. They're going to lead you on a task that basically if you sort of emulate them and follow what they've been doing, you should be successful in staying up and, uh, and, and maybe completing a small task within, uh, within a short distance from your field. The nice thing about uh, flying with someone that has uh, cross-country experience is that they're able to mark the thermals for you and therefore you can sort of see the thermals, what they're going for, why they're going for a certain thermal, why they're going for a certain cloud. Um, if they've marked it for you, it should just be a matter of you following them, uh, following thermal protocol, so make sure that you're going in the same direction that they're going in, because they'll obviously have initiated that thermal first, they've gone into it first, and you're just basically following them around the sky. and. Uh, um, it's a great way to learn the ropes of cross-country soaring. Another excellent um, uh, step to, f to build on your skills is to get involved with the Condor Simulator. Um, this is a, a, an internet-based program that allows you to fly a number of different types of gliders, both low performance and super high performance, all within the confines of the, the comforts of your home in front of a computer screen. And uh, it allows you to uh, uh, emulate flying a glider without uh, actually being in the cockpit of a real glider. So you're going to learn how to winch, you can learn how to arrow tow, you're going to learn how to find thermals, you're going to learn how to core thermals, and then you can set a number of different tasks. You can keep something really small, you can follow a set task that actually that's provided for you within the program depending on what you, which one you choose, depends on the scenery that you've decided to uh, follow. I mean, it's a great program. Uh, you do have to buy into it, so it's a one-time fee that gives you the right to uh, to 
join these different tasks or create your own task or if you even get to the point where you want to race against other people. Uh, it's a worldwide um, simulator program. So certainly I've I've been involved with that and on Monday nights it's called the Monday Night Soar and you can certainly fly against other pilots from around the world on a, a set task and there's always you know first, second, third place. You can see the results at the end of the uh, the following day. But it's just a great program that truly um, gives you the sensation of flying gliders without actually uh, being in one. It, it's it's a very it's a very good program to uh, to help build your skills. And it's a great way to keep sort of fresh uh, if you're not flying obviously in the winter time. Then get on Condor and uh, it feels like you're right there. So, so you can use this to sort of build your cross-country skills like while being safe, like a sandbox to play in. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the whole key. It's 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 virtually flying a glider without actually being in one. And uh, I mean, it 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 follows everything that you'll come into play with respect to cross-country flying and and actually flying a glider. It's very, very realistic. Um, so with respect to our skill building, of course, when I'm talking about these skills that I've just mentioned, um, these are all within the confines of your of your club field. So you're all practicing these skills while you're still flying local cross-country flights. Um, so another thing to think about, uh, another exercise that's very practical is to prepare a map showing where to fly small triangles with easily identifiable turn points upwind of your club. So turn points such as road intersections or towns or any geographical feature, uh, maybe a silo or maybe a, you know, a communications tower, something like that. So something that you can identify and you're going to use these as turn points to help define your triangle. Certainly using your club field as a turn point will help keep uh, the pucker factor are tolerable and these are just small very easily flown triangles that will again allow you to get back to the club should you have to bail it on on the task the height required to reach the club field anywhere along the triangle is marked on the route and uh, of course you you want to make sure you've added a thousand feet to each of these indicated heights to allow for that proper circuit when you do get back to the field, if that's the case. Um, depending on the day, the height needed for a final glide. So when we talk about a final glide, that's when you've attained the necessary altitude to be able to fly straight back to your home field without having to circle and stop for a, for a thermal. So it's just a straight flight, no turns. So if you've got final glide, and that's it's always a nice feeling to get when you're on a cross-country flight, is your your flight computer or whatever you're using, maybe you've done the mental arithmetic, you know, oh, I've got final glide, I can just now enjoy, you know, the, the stress is a little less off yourself, um, I can fly straight back to my field without having to look for those thermals to keep me up. So depending on the day, the height needed for that final glide from the farthest turn point should be fairly easy to attain from a thermal. Of course, now, it depends on the day that you pick, but I'm assuming that with your first uh, few triangles, maybe these tasks, you're going to pick a nice day with some decent thermals. With respect to what I've just talked about, if you wanted to refer to pages 119 and 122 in the SAC publication SOAR, it describes it uh, very nicely there. Okay, so then we get into some paperwork. If this is a badge declaration, and there are different badges, and I'm not going into badges tonight, that's another topic, but there are different badges, and obviously there are steps, so you can start low and slow and work your way up to the big diamond badges and what, what, what not. But what you have to do is every club should have an OO, and what that stands for is an official observer. These official observers are, um, are certified through SAC, They've taken a, a small little quiz and they've, they've read the uh, FAI um, sporting code rules and whatnot. So as long as you've, uh, you've declared this with your OO, they will be able to refer you to the necessary FAI paperwork. And all of this stuff is available um, on the SAC webpage, I believe underneath documents.
So FAI is uh, it's French, it's Fédération de Aéronautique de International, or something along that line, excuse my French. Um, but it's an internationally recognized achievement, uh, these badges in the soaring community. So after you've declared this with one of your club's OOs and you've completed the necessary paperwork, then you're on your route. You're not quite there yet, but you're on your way to, uh, to going after that badge flight. In the event that your GPS uh, does not want to cooperate with you, then you should have a prepared map prior to your cross-country flight. And in fact, this is an FAI requirement for the silver um, badge, for the 50-kilometer portion of your silver badge. You may not use a GPS for that flight. You have to use... Uh, charts or maps, and I suggest that you you, well, you have to get the latest version of NavCan's F, uh, VFR navigation chart, and usually the uh, one to five hundred thousand scale works best for that. Uh, plot your task, uh, so plot your task using straight lines and mark your turn points. Now. Your 50-kilometer flight does not have to be a triangle. In fact, it might very well be just a straight flight. Mine was, and so was uh, Dave's. We flew straight from Great Lakes to York Soaring, which is just over 50 kilometers, so it worked out perfectly. Um, so again, a, a straight point-to-point -point flight might be totally fine and totally suitable for your first 50-kilometer uh, silver badge flight. Jim, can I pop in for a sec? Certainly. Uh, another option for your 50K, which can sometimes help with the I'm getting too far from home, is if you fly east 25 kilometers, turn around and fly west 50 kilometers, and then turn east again and fly back home. That counts right. as well. So uh, you don't have to land at your destination. So it's not like you have to take off and land at York Soaring or some other destination. Um, you can, as long as you fly... 50 kilometers in a straight line somewhere um, between two points. So one, one way you could consider doing it is is kind of fly 25K out one way, head back to the field, pass overhead, and then go 25K the other way, and then, you know, head back. The, the nice thing about what Dave just described is that you're never more than 25 kilometers from your home field. So that could keep it a little more uh, tolerable for some plants that just don't want to quite get that far away. Now, you're still going to be far enough away where you're going to have to thermal. You're not going to have final glide, depending, of course, on your glider that you're using, but it might be a little bit more um, easier to assimilate and, and get through your mind that, okay, I'll, I'm going to go 25 kilometers east, 50 kilometers west, and then I've only got another 25 kilometers back east again to get back to my home field. You good, Dave? Yep, that sounds great. Okay, so... Um, so, the, uh, okay, next, next slide. So, in terms of your planning uh, on the map that you're preparing, let's say you're preparing a map for um, some, again, this could be a, a local flight or it could be a, a, a flight where you are actually going to get away from the club. Um, suggestion is to draw five or six concentric circles. So, concentric basically means it's like a bullseye. It's like a bullseye in a... Um, a target for uh, shooting arrows, right? archery. So draw, draw five or six concentric circles about uh, five or say 10 kilometer increments centered around your home field. Now, the purpose of these circles is to enable you to readily estimate your distance from home when you're getting close and the altitude required to get there. So you're basically turning the map into an oversimplified glide calculator. You'll need to learn the altitudes needed to make progress against different wind strengths and write these on the map beside the concentric circles. So you always need to be aware of headwinds and tailwinds. So you're going to mark both a headwind and a tailwind speed to fly. And again, when you refer to those maps on page 122 and 119 on your SACS, or I believe it shows you what I'm talking about. So you're going to mark both a head and a tailwind speed to fly. And basically, a good rule of thumb is that for a for a headwind, you're going to add one half to one third the wind speed to the speed for best LD, and that's going to help you give your best penetration in, into the wind. For a tailwind, you're going to subtract one half to one third of the tailwind speed from the speed for the best LD, and that will tell you the speed at which it flies. So essentially. You're flying a little faster into the wind 
and you're slowing down with a tailwind, making best use of the efficiency of the glider. And then also on this map, it would be a good idea to note uh, you know, known airports and airstrips in case you happen to get low and you're thinking, oh, I might be landing out. Airports and airstrips are, make great land out fields. Okay, so you're cutting the apron springs. You're, you're, you've done your paperwork and you're keen to go. So this is the quick picture. This is my 50 kilometer flight. Uh, same location. Dave and I both, uh, of course, on different days, but we both went to York Soaring and I was in a borrowed glider. Um, thanks to Nancy Eber and Carrie Kirby, I was able to borrow uh, Nancy's glider and um, flew to York on a 50 kilometer one-way flight. I landed, got my paperwork signed, actually bought a tow and then flew back to my home field. So it was a kind of a nice day. Um, lovely day and uh, brought back some good memories just looking at these pictures again. So preparations. So you need to prepare yourself and let's start with the trailer. So you obviously every glider that you're going to fly should have a trailer or at least have a trailer accessible to you so that you can bring it back if you happen to do a one-way flight or if you get caught landing out. So obviously it needs to be serviceable. You need to check the lights, make sure the brakes are working, the tires are inflated, that you've got a spare. Bearing should have been greased within the last couple of years. Make sure you bring a wing stand because that's going to help you when you de-rig your glider and any tools, so both for the trailer and for any glider items. You'll need to bring any rudder and aileron locks, any dollies for your fuselage and tail for the fuselage, tail uh, dolly for the glider. And make sure that you're taking the right trailer. So usually, um, uh, identify, I spelled that wrong, should be identified to each other. Usually most trailers have uh, either the contest letters or some sort of identifying um, markings on it saying that this is the trailer that goes with this glider. So just make sure you, you've got the right trailer. It'd be terrible if you went and picked up a glider and you got the wrong trailer. So on, on so that note, uh, on the wrong trailer note, just a quick fun little story. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the clubs, I think it was Sosa, bought a K6 from BC, from like Vancouver, BC, and the guy drove up to the club one night, picked up one of the two K6 trailers, drove out to BC, opened the trailer to load their new glider onto their empty trailer, discovered he had grabbed the full trailer, not the empty trailer, had to drive all the way back to Ontario, swap trailers, drive all the way back out to BC with the empty trailer. Yeah. So check your trailer. Might be good to open uh, it and look inside. I mean... Uh, most people have some sort of identification on their trailer or they at least know yet yeah that's Jim's trailer or that's Dave's trailer and and uh, it's good to go but um, you know, if you're in a contest or if you're on a different field maybe you're flying off of a different field just make sure that people know that your trailer uh, is, is is known so with respect to um, preparation for the tow vehicle you want to make sure that uh, you've got a tow bar with the correct ball size. So there are commonly it's one and seven eighths and two inches are the different ball sizes. So you want to make sure you've got the right one. And if you're not sure, then carry both. Uh, emergency money. Now, it seems more and more I'm hearing that uh, in order for people to get their gliders out of, a, out of a field, some farmers are charging a fee. And I think this is happening more in the US than it is in Canada. I've landed out I think, six times and I haven't paid a fee yet, um, but it's always good to have some money on hand in the event that you you do have to, or if you've landed in someone's crop and uh, the farmer's not too pleased, so then at least you can offer to pay for what he thinks would be a reasonable um, compensation for the crop damage. So it's always nice to have some emergency money or if you happen to you know, run into some car problems or that type of thing. I carry an automotive GPS in my car so that if I happen to land out, I can uh, indicate my GPS coordinates to my retrieval crew. They can go into the car and punch those into the GPS in the car and then come and find me. Um, I always try and leave a full tank of gas because you never know how long your retrieve might be. Uh, 
checklist for the retrieval crew is always a good idea because you can't rely on them to bring everything. Uh, they might have a good idea, but a checklist for them, and we always operate with checklists in aviation anyway, so it would be a good idea to, uh, to include a checklist for your retrieval crew. And that way, you know, if they arrive um, without something and you didn't have a checklist, well, then it's as much fault as yours as it is of theirs. So checklists are good. And then, of course, I don't know, I think someone gave me this one, I think Carrie gave me this one, cold beer for the down pilot. So obviously, if <laughs> you've got a cold beverage after a, a long wait, it's always nice to have something cold to drink. And the retrieve. Okay, so in the event that you've landed out, uh, make sure that you are not flying your glider with your car keys in your pocket. Pretty hard for people to start your car when you've got the keys up uh, God knows where you are. So I just leave my car keys in the ignition, and if there's any trailer keys, you want to make sure that they're either left in the lock or in the magnetic key holder or what have you. So make sure they're accessible. If you've landed out, you need to inform your retrieval crew of your landing coordinates and any cell phone numbers should be given to your retrieve crew. And if there's any roadmaps required, uh, if it's an area that's not too known, roadmaps are always a good idea. So either a, a map of Ontario or actually I've got a map of Simcoe County, so something on a smaller scale that um, makes it easy for people to come and get me. Okay, so the day before, pre-cross-country checklist. So you've secured a tow pilot, so what happens, I know at our field is sometimes we'll fly midweek. Most of our operations with the club activities are on the weekends, but the private pilots, if we've got a good day through the week, uh, we get on the phone and we say, yeah, it's looking good for Wednesday. We've got a nice high over Chicago. It's going to come in. Wednesday looks like a nice, beautiful, soaring day. So the first thing we do is we make sure we've got a, a tow pilot. We've checked the weather. Anything that runs on batteries, we make sure they're charged and ready to go. You want to make sure you've got some rigging help for my particular glider, any of the K6 gliders. It works really well with three people. And of course, you're going to need a wing runner, so someone to uh, hold your wing while you're while you're launching. And you want to make sure you've got somebody lined up to come and retrieve you. Now, for the guys that fly midweek at our club, um, if one of us lands out, we it's an understanding that uh, the guy's still flying. Yeah, they're they're going to finish their fight. They're going to have some fun, but when they land, they're going to pack up and then come and get you. So you just want to make sure you've got a retrieve crew lined up. Your cell phone's already charged with the necessary cables, that you've got lunch and some snacks uh, either that you're going to prepare or you've prepared. You always want to make sure you bring some drinks. You've got the necessary maps and any frequencies of any uh, outlying airports or uh, things that you need, and your flight computer. So if you're running like a Dell Streak or an UDI, you want to make sure it's all uh, charged up and you've got your task uh, maybe inputted into it or at least the uh, turn points ready to go. With respect to your glider, uh, obviously you're going to need a parachute and there should have a first aid kit. Every glider, whether you know it or not, should be uh, equipped with a first aid kit and you're probably going to have your portable flight flight computer like a Dell Streak or an UD and you may have a PCAS or some sort of a device that warns you of any uh, impending traffic in the area and of course if they come with batteries you want to make sure they're charged and ready to go. A lot of gliders are now equipping themselves with FLARM which is a, um, a system that allows you to detect other gliders that have the farm farm installed them installed them in their glider as well. So it just allows you to determine their, I believe it's their altitude, their uh, whether they're coming towards you, away from you, that type of thing. Dave, did you want to say anything about farm? Farm's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. so what farm does is is it's a glider to glider technology that uh, basically is designed to help you. Uh, raise awareness where the other glider is, if it's above, behind, distance, as well as the alerts. Um, and what the software does is it looks at your path and the other path and, and calculates, are you on a collision course? 
So when the alarm goes off, you're basically on a collision course and it alerts you. Um, there's also a second version of FLARM, which most people are going with, which is called a power FLARM. And what it does is it will interpret uh, standard transponder signals. So it will tell you if there's power traffic in the area. So if you're flying along by yourself, you know, you know on a nice week, weekend or a weekday, no one else is around and your FLARM will let you know that there's other power planes around because they don't tend to see us very well. Good, thank you. You're welcome. And of course, uh, you know, cell phones, cables, some of this is a bit, uh, has been mentioned previously, so food and drinks. So I always carry, uh, I have a, a lot of guys carry um, these hydro packs and I just have uh, it stuffed in behind me with my tube running towards me and I just uh, stuff it underneath one of my parachute um, straps and I've got uh, accessible water, two liters of water, which is plenty for the course of the day if, depending on how long my flight is. Some people carry um, Gatorade or sport drinks in a little pouch, but certainly you're going to need something to drink and you should have some sort of food. So I carry easily consumed things like uh, bananas. I might have an apple, a muffin, some grapes, that type of thing. Something just to keep the blood sugar level up uh, while you're flying. You do not want to be dehydrated and you want to make sure that uh, your belly is uh, has some food inside of it. Sunscreen obviously goes without saying. We spend a lot of time underneath that perplex with uh, the sun beating down on us, so you need to wear a hat, sunscreen. In the event that you do land out, you should have some bug spray. Uh, potentially a small sleeping bag. You never know how long your crew is going to be uh, coming to get you. You may be sleeping underneath the wing or inside of your cockpit until someone shows up after dark. Um, a land out kit, including rope. So one of the things I have in the back is a small little sleeve that fits over the wingtip of my glider that I can slip over and then tie it down. And the rope also is, should be um, long enough, at least uh, greater than the distance of, I think, half the distance of your wingspan. In the event, let's say a farmer decides or, you know, is cordial and is going to tow you out of the field towards the gate, then it would be, be nice to have a little tow rope that you can attach to your glider and uh, someone can use that to tow you out of the field with. And, so and I have done this, that. I've yeah. been towed out of the field with a tractor, with a farm tractor. Yes, That's absolutely. Good. So all, all farmers usually are pretty nice, but uh, if you get a really nice one and they're offered to tow you out, by all means, it would be nice to take advantage of that. And to go with the, uh, the landing out, so obviously at the end of the day, it might be, like I say, it might be dark before someone comes and gets you. You need something long sleeve, both your shorts, uh, long sleeve uh, pants, long sleeve clothing, maybe a slight little windbreaker. Reading glasses, if you need re reading glasses like myself, you're going to need all your maps, your flight supplements and uh, frequencies. You're going to need sunglasses, and I think it's required by law you need to have something that... Uh, tells the time, some chronological device like a watch. Your, your cell phone, if it, if it has the time in it, which most do, and then that's fine as well. Okay, so just to reiterate, uh, you've seen this slide before, so basically we've got convective uh, lift on the left, so here's a, a thermal that's developing, there's a warm spot on the earth, the sun's heating it up and it's released itself into a nice bubble and it's formed a nice juicy cloud and there's the indicator, there's the marker for your thermal. So convective lift, uh, either at the ridge or west, they've got uh, uh, ridge lift um, coming off of a, a mountain or, a, or an escarpment. And at the very bottom, there's the, of course, the wave. Now the wave is big out to uh, Cali, Alberta. In fact, um, we even see the odd lenticular cloud in our area, but basically it's it's lift it's generated after it, the, the wind goes up and over a mountain range and on the leeward side it forms these undulating uh, uh, bars of lift, lift and sink and, and these can go actually quite high. So basically for southern Ontario or for most part where we'll be flying it's uh, the left side, side one, the, the thermals, the, the convective lift. And this is, if you've seen this before, this is just a little computer generated thing of uh, glider and they're going on the cross country. So you can see that uh, the red circles, they're climbing in lift. The blue straight lines is their sink. So they're pushing the nose down and they're flying through the sink. And then they slow up and lift again, climb to the top of that thermal or as high as that working band might be. We'll talk about that later. And then off again, 
on another dash to the next thermal. So this is typically how you fly cross country. You're just going from thermal to thermal or you're flying along any sources of lift that you can, ideally without circling if you possibly can, which minimizes uh, the amount of time you're spending over one particular spot. You gotta think of thermals like gas stations. So if you can reduce the number of gas stations, then you're going to fly further and probably faster, which enables you to put in some decent cross country distances. Now, before I go into sync and speed rates, uh, does anybody have any questions at this point in time? Uh, yes, Jim, we actually do have a couple. So the first one uh, is from Svetvan. What is a spot landing? So you referred to a spot landing earlier. Yeah, so part of your bronze badge, and Dave, you might have to help me with the exact uh, parameters of that, but I know you have to go over, I think it's a meter high obstacle and land within, and what's the yardage or what's the meters? One, but you, you've 150. Got to do it on 150 meters? Yep. Yeah. So you have to do that on three consecutive flights. So typically, you get a nice day with just a little bit of a headwind or maybe a, a decent headwind. Good day to do some spot landing because you're going to be able to bring that glider down in a specified distance and stop before you roll past the 150 meter mark. Right. And Dave, you want to add anything to that? Absolutely. And, and the, the idea here is we're, we want you to demonstrate the skill that you can put it over a uh, fence, because a typical fence is one meter high, and that you can get down and stopped in a relatively, uh, well, a very short distance. And the idea here is that we're simulating an off landing into a farmer's field. And the idea of the three consecutive is if you do it once, it could be a fluke, right? <laughs> so we want to see that you can, you know, reliably do this is, is kind of what the idea is. So when we say three consecutive, we mean in the same day as well. Um, uh, it actually, there, I don't believe it has to be the same day. It just, no? okay. it, it's just three consecutive flights. So if you do two on one day and one on the next day, okay. I think that's acceptable. But you can't do it like, ooh, I got a, I got one spot landing, and then you try three more times, and then you get another one, and that's two. No, it has to right. be three consecutive, so that you're basically demonstrating you can repeat this on demand. I think most people find the the, the nice day to do it on, and they, they try and bang off all three in the same day. But I guess yeah, you don't yeah. have to do them on the same day. Yeah, you don't have to. Just have to be day. three. The, the key word is consecutive. Correct. Um, the second other, another question. Yeah, yeah, we've got actually two more. Um, the next one is a closed task. Are, are closed tasks considered cross country? And by closed tasks, I think um, he means like if you do like a like a triangle and then come back home. I think any time you venture away from your your club field, whether it's a uh, uh, downwind dash or whether it's a triangular or whether it's a, a box shape, it's, all of those can be considered cross country. So cross country is you've gone beyond your club where you have to find lift in order to get back. In other words, you just can't go like five kilometers north and then five kilometers east and, and then come back to your club. You have got to go beyond the the parameters of the, um, the efficiency of your glider. You have to find lift in order for you to get back to the field. So that was what we could sort of simply define as a cross-country flight. And if that's in a triangular shape or a box, what have you, then by all means, it's cross-country. Fantastic. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, another one from, and this one's from Roger, actually. Uh, can you do cross-country with an instructor, or is the weight too heavy? No, we've actually, in um, uh, 2007, we actually entered one of our um, Crosnos uh, trainers, 27 to 1 glide ratio, uh, all metal glider, great visibility, but not real pretty to rig and rig, but we actually put an instructor in the back with the student up front, uh, Carrie was the instructor, and they actually entered the uh, provincial contest and flew the task successfully and uh, no land out. So by all means, you can do a cross-country task with an instructor. Great way to learn if you've got uh, a nice two-place uh, glider with decent um, performance. Ab absolutely. And and Carrie's the guy to talk to on that. Um, he's been known to do this on, I wouldn't say a regular basis, but he's, I remember Alan one day sending out an email and his GPS traces, they went out past Orangeville and back in the Crosno, and he thought this was just the greatest thing ever. <laughs> so yeah, you can absolutely do that. 
Um, and, and keeping in mind, of course, uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, you can plan those small steps. So there's a lot of little airports around us and you want to just, you know, start to get your legs a little bit, we can plan a, you know what, let's fly out 5K or 10K, fly back, but let's plan it so that there's airports you can land at, so if you do have to land out, you know, we can send the tow plane and, and tow you home, right, because there are approved airfields that we can use for that. Which actually leads into our next question, which how does retrieval work if you land out using one of the club's gliders? <laughs> <laughs> David, would you like to address that? Sure. So um, now if you land out in the Crosno, um, it's it's a big heavy beast to derig and you need like five, six people. So we, we discourage that. However, the K6 and the Jantar, they're lovely ships to fly and they're lovely ships to rig and derig. So it's it's just like if you're flying your own private ship. Make sure that you have some people available to to retrieve you make sure that the trailer is ready the real difference here is that you're going to be using your vehicle on effectively someone else's trailer so you know if you have your own glider and your own trailer it's all going to be set up make sure that you have an adequate tow vehicle and that it is there on the field hooked up and that the trailer is ready to go so once you do get into cross country um, you know if you want to do a, a couple of short ones with carry and the Crosno great way to start and then when you get up into the into the K6 or even the Jantar, you know absolutely sign them out, uh, touch base with with um, the board just to let them know that you're taking it. Um, you are responsible for any expenses. So if you damage the glider, for example, you're going to pay the deductible, um, which is you know you're going to pay that anyways if it was yours or, or the club shifts. And yeah, go for it. We have two serviceable trailers. You know we encourage that. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the natural progression for anyone that stays with the sport is is you want to go cross country. You want to sort of flex your muscles, expand your wings, and see what's out there beyond five kilometers from the field. And, uh, and if you don't have the funds to purchase your own, then that's what clubs have, ships that you can rent, and, and we've got two perfectly fine ones to do that. So uh, the, the K6 is a great little ship to start out with, and then once you get tired of that one, then you can move into the Jantar and, and go even further. Absolutely. Any other questions? No, we're good at the moment. Okay. So let's just quickly talk about speed and synchrony. The sync rate. So basically, this illustration we've seen it a few times now simply shows that four identical gliders uh, starting together after one minute shows their positions relative to their starting point, and it'll be shown by the distance graph. So different horizontal different uh, different horizontal distances are are flown based on the respective airspeed and corresponding sync rate. So um, you know, there's things like minimum sync rate and uh, best LD speed, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. So just uh, just be aware that as you fly at different speeds and in different air, you're going to either fly further or shorter than somebody else. So if we take those four same gliders from the previous illustration and connect those gliders with a smooth curve, and change the distance scales to speed scales, we've essentially just drawn a polar curve. And in this instance, it's for a Schweitzer 126. Now you might ask, well, what, what's a polar curve? Well, if you look at the horizontal and vertical axes, basically a polar curve, and every glider has a polar curve, it's a graph that contrasts the sync rate of a glider with its horizontal speed. And we can get lots of information from a polar curve, from a polar graph. Knowing the best speed to fly is important in exploiting the performance of a glider. So two of the key measures of a glider's performance are its minimum sync rate and its best glide ratio, also known as the, as the best glide angle. And these occur at different speeds. So knowing these speeds is important for efficient cross-country flying. In still air, the polar curve shows that flying at the minimum sink rate enables the pilot to stay airborne for as long as possible and to climb as quickly as possible. But at this speed, the glider will not travel as far as if it flew at the speed for best glide. So sure, you can fly at minimum sink rate speed 
and you might stay up a long time, great for your five-hour duration flight and part of your silver badge, but you're not going to go very far in cross-country. So, Jim, as opposed to, yeah. just to connect that back to the graphic, the green glider is flying at minimum Hello. sync. Let me go back here. No, no, you're, you're at the right one. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so on that curve, the minimum sync is the green glider. It's basically the very top of the curve. And the yellow glider is actually at best LD, or best glide Correct. ratio. And then we've got another one coming up, which will further explain that part. So when in sinking air, the polar curve shows that, best, that the best speed to fly depends on the rate that the air is descending. So using Paul McCready, and Paul McCready was an aeronautical engineer that developed this McCready's theory. You may have heard that. So his theory was... You know, it's, it's the optimal speed to fly for best cross-country speeds. And it varies and may often be considerably in excess of the speed for best glide ratio if, for instance, you're getting out of sinking air as quickly as possible. So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So if we started this exercise with the four gliders, and let's say we just, for sake of argument, started them at 320 feet above the ground. The red glider is already on the ground, so you can see it's already landed. If we continue the descent of the other gliders until the blue and yellow gliders also reach the ground, we see several things. First, the yellow glider goes farther than any other. The blue glider touched down about the same time, but doesn't go nearly as far and the green glider is still in the air, but will crash on top of the red glider if it doesn't move quickly. So what we've seen here is that the yellow glider has the best glide ratio of all the gliders, and again, using that polar curve, it will help you give this useful information. And quite often, flight computers in uh, some of these fancier gliders will do this automatically for you. So it tells you the best speed to fly at, it tells you whether you've got final glide, whether you're going to make it to your destination, and so on and so forth. But polar, polar curves can give you this information. You need to study them, extract the information you can because it's for that particular glider, and then apply it to your conditions at hand. So it kind of gives you like a rule of thumb. You're not going to carry a polar curve up with you in a cockpit, but you can at least derive that information during some of your preparation work, and then you could have like a chart or you can have some figures written down that you know will apply to you whether you're flying into a headwind we're using a tailwind. So sinking air. This illustration shows sinking air, how it affects our glide. So here the red glider is sinking faster than the yellow glider, but it's moving horizontally much faster. So even though it's sinking faster, it's going through the air horizontally much faster. So the, the end result is that it gets out of the sinking air at a higher altitude than the yellow glider. So generally, rule of thumb, it's better to speed up and sink and slow down in the left. So speed rings or McCready rings, you may have seen these. These are these little detachable rings that go around, sort of snap on the outside of a variometer. They were invented by Paul McCready, who was an aeronautical engineer, as I mentioned, to derive the optimum speed to fly between thermals. So the speed ring is adjustable, uh, but for our current definition of speed to fly, it should be set with the arrow on the ring pointing to zero on the variometer. So when the variometer points to any rate of descent, it is also pointing to the corresponding speed to fly. And that's the outside numbers. So those outside numbers on the ring, those are the numbers, those are the, that's, your, that's your air speed. So you've already predetermined that based on your polar curve, based on your glider. So when the variometer points to any rate of descent, it will also point to the corresponding speed to fly, the one that produces the flattest glide under those specific conditions. Okay. Jim? We're almost, yep. Why, why don't we do our break here, because it's about uh, the halfway point, and I think this is probably a pretty good spot. Beautiful. I don't have a watch on, so I'm glad you mentioned it, that. Okay. It, it's like two minutes to eight, okay. and, and uh, we've just had, I think, a really good explanation and description around, you know, the speeds to fly in the polars, and now we'll be getting into thermaling, and let's do our break here. Sounds good. Is that 10 minutes, Dave? 
Yeah, 10 minutes. Um, we just have one question from Dave Bradley. What did the yellow glider do to get the best range? So it flew at the best speed to fly based on the, the sink that it was in, based on the speed that he chose to fly at. So he flew the furthest because he was good at determining the best speed at which to fly given the conditions that he was flying through. Right, and and the faster you go, the faster you sink. So um, we get into a, a, a trade-off, absolutely. And as, as you slow down, although you slow your sink rate, as you continue to slow down, your, your sink rate actually starts to increase, and hence the, the one that goes very slow. Um, and, and yes, we are talking airspeed, not ground speed. Right. So Roger just chimed in and said, is that airspeed or ground speed? Yeah. Okay. Okay, ten, ten, is that it? We're good yeah. there, Dave? So what I'm going to do, Jim, is I'm just going to take control again. Uh, where the heck yeah. are you? There I am. Okay, cool. Um, and I'll put a timer up so we'll all be able to see. Show my screen. There we go. Um, I also put up the uh, the ad for York Soaring's, um, the, the Nationals that's happening this summer. So just yeah. as a little, if anyone you know wants to try out some of these cross-country skills that we we're learning today, a good way to start is to fly in a national competition. That's probably <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we'll do our 10-minute break. I'm just going to start the timer. There we go. And uh, I'm going to mute while we're gone. So uh, everyone will be on mute. When we come back, we'll do a, a brief unmute, check in with everyone, and go from there. Sounds good? 8, 10, okay. Okay, see you in a bit. Sounds good.
Okay, 30 seconds to go, getting into the countdown. Jim, you still with us? I'm there. Do you hear me? Yep, I hear you fine. I'm just going to unmute everyone, so we'll have a chance to chat and ask questions if anyone wants to. I'm going to leave Dane muted because he's noisy. <laughs> all right, we're all coming back here. Okay. Everyone but Dane is unmuted, so welcome back, all. Just as we get restarted, and there's our timer. <laughs> all right, just as we all get restarted, were there any questions, comments, thoughts from uh, the first half? Nope. Okay. Um, had a quick little offline chat with Roger. He he posed the question around uh, this is airspeed, not ground speed, which you know absolutely. And what we're taking a look at today is the uh, the basic version of this. So you know if you have a tailwind, if you have a headwind, if you're flying in flying in lift, you're going to be adjusting these speeds. But what we want to do is get you the basic first, and then we'll build on those as we go. So if no one's got anything. Then I'm going to mute everyone. Again, raise your hand if you've got any questions. Type into the question box and I'll relate them. And uh, we'll pass it back over to Jim. Okay, Dave. So does everybody have, Dave, the uh, the screen, the flight? They should. I see it. Okay. All right. So we're back. And uh, you've completed your bronze badge. The weather is looking favorable for a soaring flight. You've done all the necessary preparations. So let's discuss the four key things to know to help you be successful on your cross-country flight. So before we get to the first four things, uh, it's pretty apparent that you need to know how to thermal. So you need to master the thermaling technique. Well, I say master, I say that tongue in cheek because we're always learning, but you need to be efficient and proficient when you're thermaling. So you need to learn how to core the thermal. You need to know um, how to get to the top of it or at least to the top third of it or the top two-thirds of it as quickly as possible. So before you go on, there are four things. You need to know how to find the thermals, what to look for. You need to know where to go so you've just come off tow and, you know, okay, now what do I do? You need to go, you need to know how fast to go between the thermals and you need to know when to stop and top up your gas tank and when to thermal. Oh, now why did that go down? Oh no, what's going on? Click once on Stand your screen. It just click click right in the middle of the slide once. And then it should start working. There we go. Okay. How to find thermals. So finding the first thermal. So the advantage of an arrow toe, and well, most of us uh, use arrow toes. Um, the advantage of that is that you can be released in a thermal. So right off toe, you're in lift, which is wonderful. It can be advantageous to release in a thermal, then continue. It can be advantageous to release in a thermal, actually, before you get towed to a predetermined release height. Because sometimes, you oh, I've paid for a 2,000-foot tow. I'm going to go right to 2,000 feet. And you're not being released in lift. You're in sink. So then you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, and you're getting lower. Why not get off before 2000 when you're in a thermal? And uh, you know you can judge what it's like when you fly through with a tow plane. Get off and climb up to the top of it and, and go on from there. And it's going to cost you less if you've got a club that cho uh, charges you by either 100 feet or 1,000 foot mark. So by all means, it can be very advantageous to release in a thermal and continue to be towed to a predetermined release height. So you're at the, you've released, you're going to first of all explore the conditions before venturing off to establish where the lift is with respect to the clouds. So you want to find out, is the lift on the sunny side of the cloud? Is it on the dark side of the cloud? Is it on, you need to sort of explore and feel out what the conditions are before you all of a sudden dash off. Spacing of the thermals is directly proportional to the height of the convection layer. So the rule of thumb is that is that there's a direct relationship between the depth of the convection layer and the strength of the thermals. So if you're finding that the thermals are topping out at 65, 7,000 feet, which is pretty pretty high, pretty decent, then 
the distance between the thermals is going to be greater than if you find that the thermals are topping out at, say, 4,000 feet. So the lower the thermals are, the, the, the less distance there are to the thermals, the higher the thermals are, the greater the distance is to the next thermal, generally speaking. What to look for? Evaluating the clouds. A sharp, well-defined base, and I'm talking about a cuta, a cumulus cloud, a sharp, well-defined base and a cauliflower, crisp, outlined top is what you should be looking for in a cumulus cloud. Um, great if you can find one that's just developing. Uh, not so good if it's starting to look a little wispy, starting to fall apart. Uh, that, that thermal, that cloud is dying. It's time to look for something else. It's time to go to something that's a little more defined. The darkest part of the base is where you are likely to find the strongest lift. And of course, when you do find a thermal and you're taking it up, uh, rules say that we have to stay 500 feet beneath the base of the cloud. We are not allowed to fly through cloud. Now, not all cumulus clouds have a thermal beneath them. And I'm not exactly sure what the percentage is. It's something like one in four may not have any lift associated with that cloud. So it's, it's a cloud, but there's no thermal associated with it. So don't always expect to find lift under every single queue that you fly to. You can expect thermals at higher levels um, of upward sloping terrain facing the wind. And that's because these upward sloping uh, terrains usually dry out and heat up faster than just the opposite. So typically, that would be a nice source or could be a good source of, of a thermal. Uh, look for haze domes on blue days. So haze domes, that's when you see you know, slight hazing. Uh, it's not quite forming a cloud just yet. That could be the very well start of, of uh, it may not quite develop into a cloud. It sort of stays hazy, but it's generally indicating where there's some lift. So certainly can go cross country on blue days. Uh, there's one thought that you know at least the clouds aren't sucking you into going into something that doesn't have any lift, but it certainly is a little more challenging to go across country on a blue day. What you're looking for are features on the ground as opposed to obviously there aren't any clouds to look at. You're looking for features on the ground that will indicate to you where there might be potential lift. On windy days, you look for features in the terrain that might trigger thermals such as uh, you know, it'd be like a, a, sloping, a slope going down to a river or borders of woods, uh, the end of ridges. And I have found quite often that farmers taking off their crops, for example, wheat uh, on a day, are excellent um, triggers for thermal. So, you know, in relation to the wind, I've, I place myself a little downwind of this farmer taking his crop off and bingo, there's a thermal right there. So I've, I've experienced that quite often, actually. When the wind is not too strong, uh, you'll want to go for hot spots like ridges facing the sun, dark patches of earth, which include things, could be things like gravel pits, towns with all those nice asphalt shingles, uh, where we fly, we're close to the Honda plant in Alliston, and you can imagine on a hot summer day, not always, but I've caught more than one thermal off the roof of the Honda plant, and uh, it can work quite well. And even ripe, ripe wheat fields. So um, uh, look for all those hot spots when the wind isn't too strong. Circling birds are great, or usually good indicators of a worthwhile thermal. Um, we have hawks, the odd eagle, and certainly a lot of um, turkey or turkey vultures that seem to circle and usually when they're circling they're not flapping and usually if you look at them when you're on the ground they're going up and the same is true as when you're in a glider. If you see circling birds chances are they're probably in a the thermal and uh, they're probably going up. Um, it helped me, I know at one occasion I was flying back towards the field thinking, oh crap I'm landing out. I couldn't connect, looked off to my left, saw about five turkey vultures circling 
join them and bingo, I'm right back up to 6,000 feet. So it was wonderful. Um, if you see another circling glider, chances are they're in lift or they're searching. So before you join them, just make sure that they are climbing before you join them in the thermal. And with respect to um, the evening, so wooded sections, patches of woods. So what they do typically is they soak up the heat, the latent heat throughout the day, and then they'll release it later in the day as the surrounding terrain cools down. And this happens usually usually once, and I've experienced this. I was with a guest flight, and it was after supper, and the sun was going, no, oh, it wasn't down, but it was getting lower in the sky, and I was over top of a wooded section, and I must have just melted and gone back and forth, and, uh, and it was experiencing one to two knots of, of lift uh, over a section of woods, and it was just a wonderful guest flight. We had lots of time to look around, and we weren't coming down. We were actually gaining a little bit of altitude. Next step is to where to go. So you're, you've released and you think, okay, where do I go now? If you're flying in prolonged sink, so you might want to resist the temptation to turn back 180 degrees and head home. Because like, you're, you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm in sync. I, I, I'm not going anywhere. If you do this immediately after heading out, you might want to resist that temptation because what you're going to do is you're going to fly back through the sink that you just flew through and may find yourself with marginal altitude to reach your club field. So a better tactic would maybe to turn 90 degrees and stay on that heading until the sink subsides. You might find some lift and then you can get back on course. Generally, the cycle time for thermals on an average soaring day is about 20 minutes or so. So thermals do not last a long time, but if a spot on the earth, if, if the source of a thermal is coming from something, generally they will kick off another thermal throughout the day. So a certain spot on the earth can generate numerous thermals throughout the day. In hilly or mountainous regions, stay over the higher terrain. And you should know where to go before reaching the top of a climb. So as you're climbing, you're evaluating, you're looking ahead, you're staying ahead of the glider, you're looking to see, okay, I, I want to go in that direction, What's the cloud situation looking in my on my intended uh, route? Try to evaluate and select the next climb while climbing, having a backup or two in case your first choice doesn't work out. So maybe you've picked out a couple clouds, you've always got a backup. So you're always evaluating, you're always checking out the, the skies ahead of where you want to go. Judging the distance to the next cloud can best be done by looking at the cloud's shadow on the ground. So when you see the shadow on the ground and you see the next shadow, you can sort of judge how far that next cloud is and whether you've got uh, the legs to get there. On a windy day, strive to stay upwind of the course line at all times. I think I mentioned this earlier. It's always nice to be upwind uh, when you're flying a course line because it's a lot faster flying with a tailwind than it is trying to claw your way upwind. Now this becomes less significant, of course, on days with light winds. On days with light winds, you can more or less fly where you want, trying to stay on your task line, but you have more of a chance to deviate and maybe even backtrack if you know there was a little bit of a, some better lift behind you. It usually pays to follow cloud streets, even if they're as much as 30 degrees off track. So now a cloud street usually happens when the winds are 10 to 15 knots or greater, and what you'll find is, you may have noticed this on a summer's day, is that the clouds all kind of line up in the same orientation above you. So that's what we call a cloud street. And if you can get into a cloud street, man, you can go a long distance and never have to circle. You just sort of bounce along, you may have to deviate a few degrees here and there, but if, you find, if you're finding lift, you can cover a lot of distance um, without having to circle. Uh, if there's a cloud street ahead, the likelihood of flying in better air, of flying in better is increased if you line up at the street before you actually reach them. Now, of course, I told you what to look for, where to go, but we also need to be aware of places to avoid. So anything that's usually wet, like lakes, marshes, large ponds <laughs> um, are places to avoid because they usually do not generate lift. So it pays to avoid wet terrain. 
If it's not possible to avoid such areas, for example, it might be part of your task, because this happened to me once, we had to fly over, uh, I think it was Lake Conestoga, it was, it was a large lake, but it was a big blue hole over top of some water, so you just increase your speed, get through it, there is lift on the other side, it will be there, you just uh, need to avoid um, wet terrain if at all possible. Areas immediately downwind of lakes and marshes can be sources of sink, which should be avoided. Now, you may find lift in the rain. Let's say you happen to be flying and a cloud develops and, oh my gosh, there's some rain. Uh, you may find lift in rain, but mostly the air will be descending and sometimes at a high rate of speed. And, of course, uh, the performance of most sailplanes certainly degrades significantly when wet. So bugs are, are a big detractor of performance, but anything that's, uh, if it's wet, raindrops on your leading edge on your wings really uh, kills, your, kills your lift. And don't get caught downwind of downsloping terrain where convection uh, may be inhibited. So uh, usually on the leeward side of a hill is turbulence and sink, so you want to stay upwind of that. Now, of course, a lot of people say, well, how fast should I be flying? The $10 question, how fast should I go? Well, with respect to where to go and when to thermal, it's not quite as important, but it deserves and is worthy of, of, of a discussion. So as you leave each thermal, the objective is to get to the top of the next thermal as fast as possible. So the McCready ring, or the speed ring from the previous slide, was invented to derive the optimum speed to fly between thermals. So you set the ring to the expected rate of climb of the next thermal, and the variometer needle will point to the optimum screw, uh, cruise speed. An effective method to determine the McCready setting, basically to keep it simple, is to simply set it at the rate of climb that you are willing to stop for. Now, attempting to fly at McCready speeds also has its inherent problems as well. So if you are really poor at predicting what the air is doing ahead of you, so the idea is you set the ring at what you think the next thermal is going to give you in terms of uh, rate of climb. So poorly predicting what the air is doing ahead of you may affect your timing, whether to stop and circle for a thermal or whether to press on. You may fly too far into the thermal and accidentally exit on the weak side, or worse, regain cruising speed while in heavy sink if you elect not to use the thermal. So some people use McCready rings, uh, some people don't. On initial cross-country flights, so maybe on your first cross-country flight and you just don't want to be overwhelmed by all this information, you might do equally well by not varying your speed all that much. Um, even if you choose not to adhere to McCready, your mean cruising speeds, they need to be in accordance with the conditions, and therefore be ready to change gears. So a general rule of thumb is this. So to determine optimum cruise uh, speeds to fly, so determining optimum speeds to fly for head and tailwinds. For a headwind, you add one half to one third of the headwind speed to the glider's best LD speed. So you should know your glider's best LD speed from the polar curve, or maybe you've got that uh, in your the, the manual of the, uh, of the glider itself. So you're adding one half to one third of the headwind speed to the glider's best LD speed for a headwind. For a tailwind, you subtract one half to one third of the tailwind speed to the glider's best LD speed. And those are just general rules of thumb. So again, slow down and lift, speed up and sink, and if you don't use McCready, um, if you don't use a McCready ring, then fly according to the conditions. You want to get to the next thermal as quickly as you can, but not at the detriment of, of sinking too low or, or, or going down too fast because you're going too fast horizontally. So there's, there's a happy medium, and that's, that's the challenge. That's the fun in trying to figure that out. So, when should I thermal? When do I stop to load up, top up my gas tank? Obviously, if you want to maximize your cruising distance, your horizontal distance, if you didn't have to thermal at all, then that's the most optimal situation you get into. If you didn't have to circle at all, then bingo, you've, you're doing great. But that's 
unrealistic. So what you want to try and do is minimize that as much as you can. Because basically when you're circling horizontally, you're going nowhere over the ground. In fact, if there's a if you're beating into the headwind, you're actually being pushed back a little bit. So if you can minimize your circling by finding um, areas of lift between thermals, then by all means slow down and just maximize that lift without circling, that would be wonderful. And that's where that dolphin flying sort of comes into effect. So the most effective way to improve your average cross-country speed is to minimize circling. When you are circling, you're going nowhere horizontally, but hopefully you're going up. During the time you spend evaluating conditions before heading out, you should decide on the minimum rate of climb you are willing to stop for. So let's say in your evaluation of the thermals uh, after your release and you've uh, done some exploring and you're sort of flying locally for about half an hour, 20 minutes, and you think, okay, these thermals are working at, uh, yeah, I'm getting the odd thermal at two, but they mostly are between three and four, the other one going five and six. I'm going to, you know what, I'm not going to stop for anything less than four knots. So then you've decided on the minimum rate of, of climb you're willing to stop for. But prepare to change this with changing conditions. So you might find as you head out, geez, you know, the clouds are getting a little further apart. I might have to alter my course. Or they don't seem to be as strong as they used to be. So I might have to be willing to stop for something a little less strong than I did at the beginning. Your present altitude will also influence your choice of thermals. So the closer you are to cloud base, the more selective you should be. Theoretically, the operating or what we call the working band is considered the upper two-thirds of the convection layer. So typically when you look at a thermal underneath a cloud, it starts off fairly narrow, then it usually widens, and as it rises, it usually gets stronger, and then towards cloud base, sometimes they typically taper off. So in that stretch from ground to cloud base, there's a section called the working band, and it's usually the upper two-thirds of that convective layer. So a rule of thumb, and I've been told this by one of our club members, you know, get high and stay high. So if you don't want to follow that working band, um, if you get high, stay in that upper two-thirds of that convection layer, and then try and, and keep that, that altitude throughout your height. Now, you may not always be able to do that. If you fall below it, then it may be a bit of a struggle getting back into it. But generally speaking, there is this working band and you want to stay there. When low, um, turn 45 degrees right away in a thermal. So optimum bank angle has been proven to be 45 degrees. And when you're low, you want to make sure that uh, you try and core that thermal as fast as you can. Uh, and obviously, you might want to add a little extra speed when you're doing that. At higher altitudes, it might be advantageous to hold off for a few seconds when you fly into a thermal until the rate of climb meets your expectations. So you don't necessarily turn right away. You might want to fly into it for a couple seconds and then figure out, is my left wing rising, my right wing rising, I'm going to turn into the wing that rises and try and find that core as quickly as you can. And this may allow you to find and center the, thor the thermal core quicker. When entering a thermal with another glider, um, I'm sure this has been covered before, but I'll just reiterate this. The first one, the first glider to enter the thermal establishes the direction of, of, of the turn. So that's why back in that previous slide is before you cross, before you go cross country, you need to master your thermaline. That includes the etiquette piece as well. And you need to know uh, if, if it's a right-hand turn, then you need to be as proficient turning right as you are left. So when you are thermaline people, practice both your left and right hand turns. And I know we all probably have our favorite way to turn, but to really be proficient, you should be practicing left and right hand turns. And one little practice when you're doing your local flights is say, oh, today I'm only doing right hand turns. Or today I'm going to do the majority of my turns are going to be right hand turns and the rest are going to be left hand. Now, of course, keep in mind, if you're sharing a thermal, you need to respect what that other glider is doing, especially if they're first. When to leave a thermal, leave the thermal when the rate of climb drops to about two thirds of uh, your mean uh, your mean uh, climb rate. So, if you've got an averager in your uh, variometer, then if you've got about two thirds of what that's averaging, then it's time to go. So basically, when the thermal starts to weaken, it's time to get out of there because. You're going to spend too long staying into a, a thermal that's weakening before you move on to the next one. You want to stay in thermals that are always strong, and that's why it's always best to stay in that upper two-thirds and to leave two-thirds of what that 
thermal is typically kicking out. So usually you leave the thermal before you go to the very top of it. Tighten your turn when leaving a thermal a little bit, establishing cruising speed before you enter the sink. And situational awareness is crucial at all times. So you want to be always aware of what's going on around you, what the conditions are like ahead of you, if, especially if you're flying with another glider, always be ahead of your glider. When low, and we'll talk more about this when we get into outlandings, but if you're low, let's say you're down to below 1,500 feet, and it looks like there's an imminent uh, land out, then one suggestion, and I, I kind of agree, is that you might want to turn the radio down or off, because now you're concentrating on either finding the field or trying to find lift to stay up again. And the last thing you want to do is, is listen to someone chattering on the radio. Nobody on the radio is going to help you. That's not going to help you at all. So being low on a cross-country flight demands your full attention of trying to stay up, not to mention selecting a suitable field for out landing. Now, final glide. So this is going back to your home field. So as I said, final glide is basically when you've got the altitude that says you're going to arrive at your home field without having to circle. Yahoo, you've made it. You just have to fly a nice, efficient path to your home field, and bingo, you should be there. You need to decide on your arrival height. So obviously, you want to make sure you've added 1,000 feet above circuit height. Take into account factors such as the distance, the conditions. Maybe the conditions are uh, not quite as strong as they were at the beginning of the day. Usually, they wane as the day um, progresses. And maybe you've got some wind velocity changes with altitude. So keep all that those factors in mind. It may be prudent to add some additional margin, especially on a long final glide and if the sky looks doubtful. Allow for higher terrain en route. So if you happen to happen to uh, need to fly over a ridge or a escarpment, keep that in mind. To justify a turn when low. So you're on final glide and you think, oh crap, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. And you've just gone through some marginal lift. You want to make sure that before you turn, because when you turn, you're going to lose altitude unless you're in lift. That lift has to be fairly solid. It may pay to simply slow down or make an S turn through the lift, and that might just be enough to get you back to your field. When closer to home and on the ground, it's crucial to have a plan, and you need to know exactly where and how to get the, safe, the glider safely on the ground. This is a slide of one of my cross-country flights, and I did this with two other guys. Two of us were in a K6E uh, e glider. The other guy was in a, uh, a PW5, and we flew clockwise, so our home field, and we flew up the uh, west side of Lake Simcoe and across to the north, across to the Narrows by Aurelia, and then you can see the return route on the eastern side of Lake Simcoe. We're quite a ways away from the lake. So I remember I talked to you about staying clear of wet areas. Well, obviously there's a big sinkhole over Lake Simcoe. So we were finding good lift uh, a few kilometers, obviously, off the, the uh, east shore of Lake Simcoe. Lift was fine. Uh, the winds were coming out of the northwest, but they were marginal. It wasn't a strong winds at all. And uh, this was just a lovely flight to go around Lake Simcoe. So, Cross country is a lot of fun, especially when you go around places and do things. And this flight, for me, I think was about four, four and a half hours, and uh, a lot of good memories from that flight. So now we've entered land outs. So if you are venturing out in cross country, and if you stick with it long enough, your day will come where you're going to have to land off field. So you're not going to make it back to your home field or you're not going to make it to your intended target where there might be a field. You're going to be landing out. And here's one of our club gliders and they have landed out. So you can see the field quickly it looks like a nice cut wheat field. So uh, no crops and a uh, nice successful landing. Everything's looking pretty good there. And here we have a Schweitzer 126. This used to be Dave Dalson's, one of his, uh, he was a partner in one of these, uh, this glider, and you can see he just landed in a potato field. Um, and being pulled out, he was pulled out, I guess this is the one where he's pulled out with the tractor. 
um, along the furrows, aligned with the furrows of the potato field. But again, no damage to the glider, safe landing, nice and flat. You can see the terrain, nice and flat field, lots of room, um, a successful land out. Okay, so you're going to land out. Although somewhat anxious, you need to try and treat a land out as a, it's just a normal landing. This is when all your training kicks in. So all those circuits that you did as a student, this is where it all comes back into play now. Nothing's changed. You still fly, you know, a high key area or at least an area where you can scout and look down and pick some fields. You fly the downwind, you fly your diagonal, and you fly your, your final. Give yourself enough altitude. And altitude means time to plan and fly a normal circuit. When down to 2,000 feet, so let's say you've been flying and the day's been good and it's been, you know, you've been up at 4,000, 5,000 feet all day long and you're not quite home yet and the sky's starting to crap out on you and you're slowly coming down. So you're down to 2,000 feet. Well, this is where you need to start to look for suitable fields. You need to fly towards landable areas, not woods, not lakes. <laughs> You need to look for fields. Remember, this was probably your release height. Right? So if you've taken a 2,000 foot toe, this is the height that you released at to find lift. So relax, just fly towards landable areas. Don't panic. It may not be over just yet. You might find some lift. You might be able to sustain that, uh, that task and carry on. If you're still coming down at 1,500 feet, you need to start selecting some potential fields. Find two to three potential fields that you could think you could land at. Turn the radio down or off. It's not going to help you at this point. No one's going to talk you through a landing. You need to concentrate on landing that glider safely, keeping you safe. So you're considering a field so that your concentration is working full time. Turn the radio off. When down to 1,200 feet, you need to select a main and an alternate, and the alternate should be close enough to reach from final turn. And I know Dave will talk about one of his fields that's coming up in a few slides here. So at 1,200 feet, I know in a situation he had, he had two alternates, and it was just a matter of a little deviation to go from one to the next. Because you're getting a bit lower now where you can start to see some features of the field. You can start to discount one over the other. You might find something. You might find, oh crap, there's a, a fence I didn't see, or Oh, well, that's got some major divots or there's a ditch I didn't notice. So you might you need to have an alternate if you can. At a thousand feet, uh, select the reference point and your upwind entry, so your high key area. So you need to say, okay, at a thousand feet, I'm going to try and land. My touchdown point's going to be there, and I'm going to start to plan my circuit. Head for the circuit. No more thermaling. So you are basically committing yourself to land. If you find some lift, especially on your initial cross countries, ignore it and land the glider safely. As you gain more experience, that decision might change, but for the most part, no more thermaling. No more thermaling. At 800 feet, you want to establish your downwind, and once you've committed to land, do not change your mind and turn in any lift. Land the glider, fly the course that you've planned for yourself. Indecision at this point is not your friend. Stay the course, fly a nice circuit, just like you've done many times back at your home field. You're just flying at a different location. You're just landing at a different location. It's not your home field, but everything's exactly the same, the same kind of a circuit. Be sure you've completed your pre-landing swaths check so if you're flying, flying a glider with uh, retractable landing gear, you make sure you've, re, you know, you've lowered that down. If you've carried any water for any reason, you've dumped your water. And uh, talk yourself through it if you need be. And, and you tell yourself, you've got this. Relax. You can do this. That's a quick little picture of my glider when I landed out. And I know you guys don't uh, can't respond. You're muted. But if you look carefully, you might think, that oh, looks like a pretty decent field. Well, actually, it is because it's an airport. That's uh, Mansfield Airport. You can actually see a little runway marker in the corner there. And although it wasn't terribly wide, 
it made for a great spot to land out, and uh, it, that worked out just fine. So let's talk about field selection. So selecting fields, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So a good field to choose from include dirt fields. So basically dirt fields mean that there was probably a crop in there at one point. The uh, farmer has plowed it and uh, it should be nice and tilled and level, or it may not be level, but it should be free of crops. It should be a good field to land in. So there's a saying, I know Dave always loves to say it, land in the dirt, don't get hurt. So dirt fields, the crops been harvested or the fields have been lying fallow. Try to determine if the fields have any slope or undulating terrain. Level turf is obviously the best. If landing in a recently plowed field or a field with furrow, avoid landing across the furrow. So take into account the wind direction and if you can at all avoid landing across the furrow, it's going to really help not damage the glider and, and create a much smoother landing. When choosing to land, pick the easiest, safest position on the field. So forget about where the gate is, forget about where the road is, forget about where the retrieval is for your crew. Land the glider where it's the easiest and safest for you. People can walk. Your retrieval crew will help push your glider or carry the wings off to the trailer. That's, that's the easy part. Just land the glider safely. Keep the glider intact. Of course, airports make great landing out uh, fields, and just be aware of any uh, runway lights and cones. Avoid fields. Now, you want to talk about uh, fields not to choose, or fields with livestock or crops. Not good ideas. Uh, livestock, they're curious. They'll come over and lick your glider or step on your wings or do something worse. Um, crops aren't great. I know in southern Ontario, there's a little saying called 4th of July corn knee high. So prior to the 4th of July thereabouts, it would be okay to land in a cornfield because the crop's not high enough. After that, the crops start to get taller, and then when it's really tall, if you happen to land in a cornfield, it's like landing in a field with a thousand baseball bats. It's going to damage your glider. Field with lines or discoloration may indicate a single wire fence, like an electric fence, a ditch, or undulating terrain, which may be nasty. Assume the borders of fields have power or telephone lines. They're hard to see from altitude, but we know they're there. I mean, you just drive any, down any, any road and uh, the power lines are always adjacent to the roads and, and concessions and dirt roads. So um, make sure you've given yourself enough height to clear these obstacles. Any obstacle in final reduces the initial landing area by 10 times the height of the obstacle. So what I mean by that is, if you're landing over, say, a row of trees that are 50 feet high, then you've effectively taken 500 feet off your landing area beyond that uh, initial part where the trees are. So be aware of uh, fences, be aware of uh, trees, power lines, and that obstacle, uh, 10 times the height of the obstacle. Uh, unless, in we unless in Western Canada, roads should be avoided for landing out. So I know one of our club members was in a contest out in Saskatchewan, I believe, and nice dirt road, fields, for whatever reason, weren't uh, suitable, and he landed on the road and, and was fine. But in, in southern Ontario, roads are not a good choice to land on. All right. So here's uh, Dave's uh, former glider, Rosebud. And you can see he's uh, in a field. Now, he wanted me to make sure I mentioned that that glider was turned diagonally after he had landed. So when he landed, he landed uh, parallel to those uh, crop lines. So he actually went parallel to those, and then it was only turned after he had landed. Dave, did you want to chime in at all? Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, exactly. And, and a neat thing on this picture is I, I was sort of landing beside the um, row of trees there that you can see cutting through the picture. And as Jim had mentioned, having the alternate is a good, good, good plan. So what I did was I flew my final parallel to that with the option of, of stepping to the left and going to the other side if, uh, if things weren't, you know, working out or as I got closer and, and looked at that field. Um, this was actually on a contest. It was a blue day, so we were flying definitely on the ground, as, as Jim had talked about earlier. And that picture was taken from a York-soaring tow plane on base. That's how close I was to the 
airfield and not making it. So you know what? Instead of trying to press on and and get into a potentially dangerous situation and trying to make it to the field, I said, you know what? I'm landing out and picked a field. Um, I did overfly Chris Andrews in the Crosno with Kerry, having them landed out in a other field that was just south of there, which was actually another airport. And I, I chose not to land at that airport thinking I was going to make it to the next one, but I was a little over optimistic. So yeah, it was a good fun day. And there he is in the same field. And again, he's turned the glider, but you can see he's, the choice of his field was excellent. Nice and flat, no crops, no huge obstacles, lots of room. He didn't worry about where the gate was for the retrieval crew. He just landed the plane safely. Nice smile on his face. Um, uh, okay, Dave, same, jog my memory. What was same field from the air. So this is the satellite okay. view. That, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, and so and, he, yeah, go Dave, for it. I think you had a downwind was this way. Yes, correct. Diagonal, base, and final was in this direction. Correct. And here was his alternate. He was close enough. This is that row of trees that you guys saw earlier. He had a choice of either staying on course or deviating slightly and flying in this field here. So he had two nice alternate fields, and he chose to stay with this one right here mm -hmm. and made a nice, safe landing. And as we teach on a regular field landing during that downwind, you're taking a good look at that field because the further you go in the downwind, the lower you get to the ground, the better you can see what's what's there. And at the very top left corner of that picture is the runway for York right there. That's the runway for York. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, because that's the, this is the bull farm. There's yeah. the bull farm, <laughs> and there's the runway to York. That's so. York's runway. So you can see how close he was, but you know what? I wasn't making it, and it, if he has I, a nice, yeah, if I pushed nice on, no damage. He lived to you know tell the story the next day, so yeah. he made a good choice. And if I had pushed on, I probably would have ended up in the the bullpen, crashing into buildings, fences. It's just it's not worth yeah. it. Pick pick the outlanding field. Okay, so this was last summer. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> one of my landouts, one of two last summer, and. Um, this is what we call the tree farm, basically this area here. Our club is about five kilometers in that direction. And I was coming from this direction, the Hockley Valley area. And was getting low, getting low, and knew I was going to land out. I eventually picked this field right here. This field here was being plowed by a uh, tractor going in those directions. So I wanted to avoid the tractor, the recently plowed field, and you'll see how things turned out here. So here's the field from the air, and I came in this direction and scouted out the fields, and wind was coming from this direction. North, south, east, and west. And after surveying the fields, I chose my field, flew my downwind, diagonal, base, and landed right there. And my field that I chose was flat but very soft, and I think I've had the shortest ground run I've ever experienced. This was, now this is a, an older or picture taken before I landed out, but this field here was the one that was being plowed back and forth with the, the tractor. And there's the field again. So I landed right about here and stopped right about there. <laughs> it's a very short ground run, but it was nice, nice field. Um, Avoided the tree lines, the tree line here, you'll see that in the next picture, but uh, certainly had lots of room before the trees. Um, just made some good decisions, uh, gave myself enough altitude to uh, make some good decisions. And there's the field you can see, recently plowed in behind me, you can see over here my, my run is pretty quick, actually it looks like I caught just a bit of the plowed field, but most of it was in this uh, very 
a very soft, uh, unplowed uh, dirt field. And there again, plowed field running east-west, and this one was more or less running north-south. And there's my one of my retrieve crew that came and helped me. And there's my glider, safe and sound. This is a picture of one of our club gliders, K6, that landed just off of uh, one of our runways in a fairly low crop of corn. You can see it's not a very clear picture, but high wing K6, so nothing was damaged. I think this was before the 4th of July, so crop wasn't too bad. Pilot still in the cockpit. Down and safe. Um, were there other alternatives? Yeah, he was very close to the field, but like in Dave's situation, you know what? Didn't think he could make it, so flew a nice circuit and landed the aircraft. And I, I just want to chime in on this one, Jim. Um, the the pilot in question had gotten disoriented on the circuit, um, entered the circuit far too low, uh, was flying through the circuit with the intent to land, and then realizing he's not going to make it. And again, just as Jim indicated, he didn't push on to try to get back to the field he originally intended. He chose a safe alternate. Um, you know, so we we really give him credit for making that decision because if he had tried to push on, and and uh, you know not. And, and tried to get to his original planned field, you know, returning to home base, um, we, we probably would have had a very bad outcome. So, you know what, it's not a bad thing to land out, get the glider down in, in, in safe in one piece is much better than, than uh, you know, racking it up trying to get where you want. Thank you. That, that picture is actually taken either from the road or, which is a, adjacent right at the end of a runway or at the very end of the runway. So you can see how close he actually was, but he made a good decision based on uh, conditions and his uh, skill level and, and brought the, the airplane down safely. So kudos to him. Um, oh, so here's a, now I don't know, Dave, do we want to unmute everybody or, this is a, a satellite shot and I want you guys to take a look at this and I want you to um, try and decide from what you see in the picture where would be a Good thing to land in. And I'll just say, let's just say the wind is coming in, or either the wind is marginal or it's coming in that direction, we'll say for the sake of argument. Okay, so I'm just not meeting everyone. Wow, we're getting a lot of background noise. There we go. If it's not working, Dave, I'll just go through it. Okay, let me, let me remute everyone. Okay. Okay. So if, if anyone wants okay. to, to chime in, just type into the question box. Raise your hand. Okay, so let's look at this field right here. And for that matter, this field right here. Because I see what I described earlier as this uh, darkened areas, these little areas here indicate to me undulating terrain, so like a low spot maybe where the water runoff is uh, flowing towards a, a creek or something. So all these little darkened spots are, indicates to me undulating terrain. So I would say, mm, let's see if we can find something better. Obviously, fields like this, like this, like this, have crops. So I think there's something better. Maybe here, but rather short. So as we start to look around, I'm, you can see I'm discounting certain fields. I don't like this one. Too much uh, crop, bit narrow maybe, crop again. So it looks like I'm coming to this area right here. And in fact, you can see from the next slide, this is in fact what the best choice will be. So there's your, there's your downwind. So Jim, There's your tag. Oh, yeah. just remove all of your drawings and then we'll be able to see a little bit better. Oh, okay, sorry. A little bit more. Uh, a little bit, there you go. Erase all. There, we, there go. we go. So you can see nice downwind, look at this, they followed a nice little uh, either a road or a fence line, made a nice diagonal, base leg and into wind, came over the trees, lots of clearance there, no trees here and beautiful landing right here. It doesn't matter whether the gate's over here or here, close to the road, they landed the plane safely. 
we've got vehicles and manpower to carry the pieces back to the trailer, or maybe the trailer can come out in the field. But so the key point is to land the glider safely, regardless of where the gates might be. And there is Another a good one. pub in walking distance. And <laughs> a good pub within walking distance, which is yeah. always nice. Okay, so here again. Satellite shot of uh, some potential fields. I'm looking, okay, I don't really see anything over in this area here. Too much undulating terrain, short fields, crops, don't like it. Certainly nothing in here. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Nah, don't like that one. Maybe. But if you look carefully, hmm, there is something that's going to pop out here in just a second. Let me just get rid of and push the next slide and you'll actually see, you may have picked it out already, that's actually an airstrip. Now, pretty hard to tell if I know from this altitude, but as you get a little bit lower, it actually turns out to be a pretty decent little strip. Not really wide, but wide enough for a glider and nice and flat. And I got one more. So, anybody from Great Lakes, if you don't recognize this, you need to take a good look around next time you're off tow. You'll see this is our, what we call the S-Bend, road to Beaton that way, road to Loretto this way. And we've got some fields. Let's discount the fields. Don't like that one. Don't like this. Don't even like these. Maybe if we had to, but there's certainly something far better. And that's this one right in here. And that's the one from the picture with the yellow Crosno in the field. So if you guys remember that yellow Crosno, it, was land, it had parked itself right about here. And there's the house across the street. And in fact, that was his landing, his landing, his out landing field. So, Dave, just talk me through it. Where was your downwind? Um, so I was coming down from the north, realizing I'm not going to make it. Uh, I was a little bit more to the left, so kind of on the edge of the picture, and then just did a left turn. Yeah, so like that. Then did a left turn and a left turn into the field. A little bit further south, but yeah, you got the idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the the circuit was was further south. The circuit actually went off the bottom of the picture just a little bit. <laughs> there you go. There, something like How, that. However, I have to admit, you know, it was not the best choice of fields. There's a better Elaborate. Field. There's a better field in that picture. Oh, good point. Now, okay. So again, anybody from Great Lakes may have noticed this. There is a, there is another field that will become more apparent um, as we go to the next slide. And this this field that, has a windsock. That is actually another. It's a private airstrip. The oh, I'll add a little bit of a there. There's it's a bit narrow. Dave, you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so that one, the, it's slightly narrower than the Krosno wingspan, and the east end of it has a downward slope. So uh, if you do need to go into that field, you're best to land to the west uh, from the east, because the, the right end of that, the, the east end, has, has a pretty sizable slope on it. And with a Krosno, you'll hang about two feet of wing off of each side. So if, if the crop's tall, that's not a good field, but if the crop's low, it's a good field. Yeah. I think we got one more slide, two more slides. Okay, okay so never really talked about low altitude saves, but basically on your initial cross country flights, don't. <laughs> it's the definitive answer. Don't try low altitude saves. Wait till you get uh, old and foolish. But no, low altitude saves are very risky. Um, there have been some accidents, there have been some unfortunate accidents, and it's just not worth it. Far better to land and take the glider away and there's always another day to fly. But if you try a low altitude save, 
you never know what might happen. And here's a picture of uh, an Air Cadet glider. Two instructors decided to do a low speed flyby, pulled up into a Shondell and didn't quite make it. So not exactly a low altitude save, but this is what's going to happen if uh, you don't have things planned and decided just perfectly. It's not worth it. And that basically takes us out of cross-country flying and off-field selection. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, Carrie just chimed in while we were, we were chatting on the chat box, and I just wanted to uh, cover off what he had said. Um, an important point he wanted to add is on an off-field landing, try to land as slow as possible. Um, Good point. And what you want to do is, uh, and what we mean by that is hold off. So uh, assuming that you have the length of field, so in that, that one land out uh, with that nice long field that the week landed from north to south um, with the animation there, uh, put it down in the middle of the field. That was actually my, my landing in Rosebud in the, in the potato field. And I had probably 6,000 feet of field to play with. Back one more, back one more, that one. So I had about 6,000 feet of field to play with. So I got down, I got the field made, I made sure I wasn't going too far, and then I closed the spoilers, and I just held it off, and I held it off, and I held it off, and I probably touched down with about uh, 25 miles an hour of speed, because that airplane just can slow right down. And you get next to no ground roll. Um, you touch the ground at a slower speed, so there's less energy to cause damage. Uh, your ground roll's shorter, you know. It's just, it's it's a really good way to come in. So, um, you know, you got a strange field. You don't know what rocks and holes are in the ground, that kind of stuff. So slow equals holding off. Now, of course, if you're heading towards a fence line or a barn or a tree line or something, then, yeah, you know what, you need to, you might need to touch down a little bit more speed and, and you know, potentially do a ground loop or something to get the airplane stopped. But the better you set up on your circuit, the better you fly it, the better you'll be able to position yourself well in the field. And you look at the examples that we've shown in all of these examples, uh, the people who landed out, you know, set themselves up with good good sized field and made sure that they, they did the spot landing and hence, you know, do the spot landing uh, skill first before you start going out on your, on your cross countries. So I'm just gonna open it up, uh, just unmute everyone. I know we ran just a couple minutes over, but I appreciate your your time and patience with us, and if anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free. Okay, we're all unmuted. Any questions, comments before we sign off? Say again? Okay, so someone's got some background noise. What's available? Yeah, I can't hear. Cross country quiz. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. It is in the handouts area. I'll leave the the webinar open for a few minutes for people to do that. Uh, it is in the in the handouts area. So if you click on your control panel under handouts, you'll see the XC quiz there. Should be twelve questions. Okay. Dave, what do you what do you guys usually find a reaction from farmers or the owners of other trips, uh, landing trips when you guys uh, develop the land outside? Um, the first thing is you got to remember that you are trespassing on someone's property. Now you have a legal right to do that yeah. because as an aircraft, uh, you are allowed to do that. Okay. Now, um, I probably should have maybe included a slide in there on on that very yeah, note, Dave. On, on kind of if I could just add, if I could just add something, yeah. Sure. We, we are ambassadors of the sport, so anytime we trespass on somebody's land, it's always good to play the good ambassador to profusely apologize for trespassing on their land, to invite them to look at the glider. You want to try and win their support. You don't want to leave them irate. Um, you can certainly compensate them with money if, they're, if, they've, if you've damaged crops or what have you. But try and leave as a good ambassador, you know, if they've got kids, say, hey, have the kids come over and take a look at the glider and let them sit in the cockpit. Um, do whatever you can to smooth the waters, keep things positive, and to promote the sport. You know, I'm really sorry you apologize. I'm sorry for landing in your field. Uh, I, I had no choice. Um, Offer them a flight. So, <laughs> well, you know, whatever you have to do, just to keep everything positive and uh, yeah. but just don't want to leave. Most of them are happy that you're you're not 
you're not hurt and the aircraft's not damaged because they, they don't want to see that. In the right. land notes that I've had, I haven't had any irate uh, farmers. In fact, on two occasions, uh, there was even, nobody even around, around and waited around, and no one came, so we just retrieved the glider and left. And uh, But the people that were there, um, only too happy to help out and offer assistance, and one guy even drove me back to the club, for crying out loud. So, you know, everything's worked out, touch wood, really well so far. A lot of it is how you first meet them. So if you kind of come walking in like you you own the place and you're allowed to be there, it, it's it's not a good way to meet. You know, like Jim says, it's you know be respectful. You're 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 an uninvited guest on their property. You're an intruder. You know, apologize for that. Explain that everything's fine and you're okay. And you know, invite them out to see the plane and explain it and be an ambassador to the sport. And that's probably one of the first questions they'll ask, and certainly has been in my case, is, you know, ask, is everything okay? Are you okay? Is the glider okay? Because like, some people not knowing the sport or not knowing aviation in general, they think, have you crashed? You know, they think, oh, the big seaward, is that a crash? You've crashed? And you can just, you just have, have to reassure them that oh, everything's fine, this happens, sorry for landing here, and then just be, a, be the good ambassador. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Great question. Thank you. Any others? <laughs> Okay, so thank you again. This is Kerry. Uh, oh, yeah, Kerry. Yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, on uh, probably over 50 outlandings, I think I've had two kind of un unwieldy farmers. And, uh, <clears throat> one, one I bought off for 100 bucks, and the other one was uh, uh, just a grouchy Jehovah Witness. So, you know, it's not bad. So. <laughs> the voice of experience. Thank you so much, Kerry. Thanks, okay. Kerry. Uh, if no one else has any other questions, we'll sign off for the evening, and we'll see you next week. Um, I forget what's on the table for next week. I think it's navigation or something. Oh, no, wait. It's meteorology, isn't it, Carrie? It's meteorology. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie's going to walk us through meteorology next week. Then at the week after, we're going to look at some basic navigation stuff, and we're going to finish out our time with decision-making. Okay. So if there's anything, feel free to send us an email in the interim. Otherwise, we'll see you next Tuesday at the same time, same bat channel, same bat time. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.